Welcome back to Amazing Discoveries Sabbath School class. We will today be continuing our study of Daniel, but first let us pray before we enter into our uh, summary of last week. Father, we want to thank you once more for today we get to be with you in your word. We get to study the magnificent things that you've recorded for us. Uh, Father, I am unable to present these things without your power and your strength. Lord, I, I submit myself to you. Empty me, Lord, and fill me with your Holy Spirit that I may only speak your words, Father. I have no intention of saying anything, Lord, that you do not want me to say. So, Father, use me as you see fit. And I thank you, Lord, for all those that have decided to uh, study the book of Daniel with us. And I pray that it will be such a blessing that we will be so eager to share it with everyone. I thank you for all that you have done and all that you will be doing shortly. And I pray this in the name of Jesus, our Lord, our Savior, and our righteousness. Amen. So today we'll be studying Daniel 3, but like I said earlier, I want to quickly review uh, Daniel chapter 2, and we'll do that very, very fast uh, as I will draw on the board. Uh, we had a vision, and the vision was basically an image that looks something not like this, but you get the idea. Uh, the head was of gold, the arms and, and uh, chest was of silver, the belly and thighs were of bronze, the legs were of iron, the feet were of iron and clay, and then there was a rock that came and that smote the statue on the feet and the statue broke in pieces and after that the, the uh, rock became a huge mountain that covered the earth. And we discovered through the book of Daniel, through historical um, data, that this is actually a timeline of the different kingdoms of the world, beginning with Babylon as the gold, Middle Persia as the silver, Greece as the bronze, uh, the, feet of, uh, the, the legs of iron was Rome, and the feet was a division of Rome that went through different transformation, and it extends up to today. And very soon, this rock is going to come and destroy all of these kingdoms, and God will establish a literal, true kingdom here on earth. And one of the uh, principles that we discovered is, whosoever honor God, God honors back as Daniel never took the credit for having the uh, interpretation or even knowing the dream. He always went back to God. So let's open our Bible to the book of Daniel and Daniel chapter 3 and we'll look at the memory text today in verse 17. And it reads, If it be so, our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us from the burning, fiery furnace, and he will deliver us out of thine hand, O king. Now, the memory text highlights a very important principle. The three young Hebrew declared, without a doubt, that God has the ability to save. He can save, and that was not a problem. That was not a doubt. There was no doubt in their mind from any power, any potentate, any king, any power. In fact, Isaiah 45 2 tells us, well, God speaks himself saying, look unto me and be ye saved, all the ends of the earth, for I am God and there is none else. God here himself declare that he has the power to save. In fact, God is the only one who has the power of salvation and he offers it for free to everyone. In the book of Psalm, 68:20 we read he that is our god is the god of salvation and unto god the lord belong the issues from death keep that in mind he is the god of salvation and the issues of death belongs to him now what is the title of our lesson this week from furnace to palace so let's go to our board here and we're going to make a a little uh, breakdown of what our chapter looks like today. So Daniel 3, so we're looking at verses 1 to 7. As always, I like my little prologue here, sets up the story. And then in the next following verses, we have something very interesting. From 8 to 12, we basically have an accusation right here. And then from 13 to 15, we have an investigation. We have an investigation that takes place to um, answer those accusations. Verses 16 to 18, we have a response to those accusations and to that uh, investigation. 
in verses 19 to 23, there is a sentence that is given as well as an execution, almost side by side. And here is where it's fantastic. In verse 24 to 27, we have a overturning of this sentence. And finally, 28 to 30, we have our epilogue. And so this is what our, our study is going to look like today. This is where we're going to be focused on. So let's immediately go to Daniel chapter 1. We read Daniel chapter 3, beginning in verse 1. Nebuchadnezzar the king made an image of gold whose height was three score cubits and the breadth thereof six cubit, and he set it up in the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. Now there is no dating to uh, this story unlike the previous chapter, but we can safely assume that it is taking place after chapter 2 where uh, the events are being inspired by the dream that had taken place and most likely before chapter 4. Uh, <clears throat> it's unknown how many years have passed, uh, but there must have been several years. It's also very clear that what Nebuchadnezzar is doing here is in response to the dream that he has had. You've seen an image of different metal, and now he's making an image, but this image is fully of gold. It is, uh, it is defiance to God, defiance to the prophecy. Verse 2. Then Nebuchadnezzar the king sent to gather together the princes, the governors, and the captains, the judges, the treasurers, the counselors, the sheriffs, and all the rulers of the provinces to come to the dedication of the image which Nebuchadnezzar the king had set up. Then the princes, the governors, and captains, the judges, the treasurers, the counselors, the sheriffs, and all the rulers of the provinces were gathered together unto the dedication of the image that Nebuchadnezzar the king had set up. And they stood before the image that Nebuchadnezzar had set up. Question, who was invited? Yet all the people from the states, all the government officials were invited. And what were they invited for? They were invited for a dedication. That's why they came. Look what happens in verse 4. Then an herald cried aloud, to you it is commanded, O people, nations, and languages, that at what time you hear the sound of the cornet, the flute, the harp, the sackbut, the psaltery, the dulcimer, and all kinds of music, you fall down and worship the golden image that Nebuchadnezzar the king had set up. And whoso falleth not down and worship it shall the same hour be cast into the midst of a burning fiery furnace. Therefore at that time, when all the people heard the sound of the cornet, flute, harp, sackbut, psaltery, and all kinds of music, all the people, the nations, and the languages fell down and worshipped the golden image that Nebuchadnezzar the king had set up. What was the real purpose of this gathering? It was for worship. He called them for a dedication, but really it was worship. And it was a worship that was commended by the highest authority, the highest authority of the state, the king. He is the one who commanded worship. And what are they worshiping? They're worshiping a golden image. For most Babylonians, that would not have been a problem. They were accustomed to worshiping images all the time. So for them, hearing that command, they would have just gone along with it. Why was the threat of a burning fiery furnace even there? If people were just accustomed to doing that. Keep that thought. Now there's something very interesting about this image. Almost ten times throughout the chapter, it keeps being repeated, 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 that it is the image that Nebuchadnezzar had set up or that he had made. It's always emphasizing this. It is clear that the Bible is trying to teach us that this is a man-made worship. It is enforced by decree and law upon the penalty of death. And remember, 
I've been stressing this out that the book of Daniel is very relevant to us today. So let's pay attention because this is going to become clearer and clearer as we come to the end of today's lesson. Now, let's do a little bit of a contrast. This is our image of Daniel 2. All right, so let's put Daniel 2 right here. Okay, this is the image that we've discovered. So all of these things here are human, it's a, it's a basically, it's a human-made image. All right, we understand that. And all the material are from earthly origin. But interestingly enough, here, there is something that is not human-made, and that is the rock. This is from heavenly origin, or if you will, it is of divine origin. Okay. Now, in Daniel 3, you also have a statue that is being made. It is also made by human hand. It is also human made. Uh, so this is obviously all the material is from earthly origin. So you have a similarity between the two images. But where the contrast comes is right here. If you notice, there is no heavenly origin. There is no divine. Nothing is divine there. While here you have God as the final authority. Here, who is the final authority? It's the king. The king acts as the final authority. The king acts as God. This is obviously a defiance to the dream that had taken place. Now, it's interesting because God preserves life, right? While Nebuchadnezzar does not preserve life, he only allows it. He is no creator. He cannot give life. He cannot sustain. He cannot do anything. Okay? Now, another thing that God does is that he allows death. Okay? If you look at a, a few verses with me in the book of Deuteronomy, we read in chapter 30, verse 19, I call heaven and earth to record this day against you, that I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore, God pleads, therefore, choose life, that both thou and thy seed may live. In Colossians 1.17, we read that he is before all things, and in him all things consist. He keeps everything together. Hebrews 1.3, we read that, um, who being in the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person and upholding all things by the power of his word. God sustains life. He gives life as creator, but he is also morally obligated to sustain that very life. Something that obviously the king cannot do. In fact, what the king really does is that he sentences to death. Now, here I was very um, specific when I said that God allows death. Does God murder? There's a, a lot of these talks out there about, you know, God does not kill because God is love and all these things. But let me ask you something. Who gives the life? God is. To whom does life belong to? To God. So let me ask you. If I would lend you my pen, because you needed it and you do something, and I come and I take my pen back, that's my property, I take my pen back, am I a thief? Would you consider that theft? What about if um, someone would drop their children at my place and we'd had Bible study, we pray, we do all these things, and that person comes back to pick up their children, do I call the cops and tell them there's been a kidnapping happening? Of course not. That'd be ridiculous. So why is it that when God takes back what is his, we call him a murderer? No, he's not. This is his. 
It's his life. He gives it freely. We get to enjoy it. And at some point, he needs to take it back. It's his life. It is his prerogative to give and to take. Remember Psalm 68, 20 that we read earlier? It says, he that is our God is the God of salvation, and unto God the Lord belong the issues of death. And I'm so happy that it belongs to God and not to human kings and potentate. While God can give life, this man can give nothing. He cannot give life. All he can do is kill. Now, as we look at this, I want to point something very interesting in what Nebuchadnezzar was trying to achieve. He had one statue made of one metal to be worshipped by all. This is a, and remember, it was um, nations, peoples, and languages. It was a conglomeration of everything. It was a one world religion. The concept started in Babylon. This is the idea of statecraft and churchcraft clearly together, where the state decides who worship and how to worship and where to worship. The state's official were invited, not the religious leader, not the priest, it was the state officials. Their religious leader was the king. It was the government. Interestingly enough, when you look at this, this is not so different as to what happened at the Tower of Babel. You had, um, a lot of people are, are now trying to conclude that uh, the land you know, where Shinar and the plain of Dura is most likely the same place. So these events might actually be happening at the same place. And so when you think about it, they're building a tower to make a name for themselves while Nebuchadnezzar is setting up an image. He is setting up the image. Uh, he's defying God because he's defying the dream while the people at, at uh, the Tower of Babel were trying to defy God who had brought the flood and they wanted to reach heaven for themselves. They're inviting all the people, all the nation, everybody is together. Just like here, everybody is together. They're trying to obtain unity. Unity of faith, unity of religion. Let's put away our differences and let's focus on one image, on one style of worship. There is no tolerance for diversity in Babylon. Let's return to the scripture. Verse 8. Wherefore at that time certain Chaldeans came near and accused the Jews. These guys again, still here. Now who are they and what was their purpose? At the time when Nebuchadnezzar saw the vision of the great image, he had purpose to destroy the wise men because he discerned their deception and was convinced that they did not have the learning and power that they claimed to possess. Only by the intercession of Daniel had they been saved from a cruel and ignominious death. The king now united with these men, check this out, the king now united with these men in planning to dishonor the God of Daniel. The light that had been permitted to shine from heaven upon Nebuchadnezzar was used to serve his pride and self-exaltation. The wise men in council with the king concluded that Babylon was the kingdom was to, that was to break in pieces all other kingdom and they endeavored to make an image that would represent Babylon as eternal, indestructible, all-powerful, a kingdom that would stand forever. They were saying that this, the heavenly origin, the intervention of God in history was actually Babylon. And so they made an image completely of gold showing that there is no success, successive kingdom, that they were going to be the only kingdom. And the king was God on earth. Now it says that they came to accuse the Jews. Now, I, I thought that was interesting. The, the word in the Hebrew is karatz, and a literal translation would be something like slandering or denouncing or to accuse maliciously, to chew on. A direct translation would be to chew him up 
by slander. Slander. Very interesting word because in the Greek, the word slander is diabolos, that's Satan. Those Chaldeans were actually being like the devil. They were acting like the devil. Question, what are they really accusing the Jews of? Well, let's keep reading in verse 9. They spake and said to the king, Nebuchadnezzar, O king, live forever. Thou, O king, hast made a decree that every man that shall hear the sound of the cornet, the flute, the harp, the sagba, the psaltery, and the dulcimer, and all kind of musics shall fall down, shall fall down and worship the golden image. And whoso falleth not down and worship it, that he should be cast into the midst of the burning, fiery furnace. You can already see what they're trying to get to. You, you, can, <laughs> you, you can see their craftiness at hand. Verse 12. There are certain Jews whom thou hast set over the affairs of the province of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. These men, O king, have not regarded thee, they serve not thy gods, nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. So here it is. They're being accused of being faithful to their God. Faithfulness to, their, to the true God. Refusal to bow down and to worship an idol. That's their crime. It's fascinating also the way they frame the accusation. It's really not about worship if you, if you listen carefully. It's, it's all about them defying the king, refusing to bow down to the image, refusing to listen to the king, refusing to pay uh, homage to him. It's all about them versus the king. It's so clever. Now you know why there was a fiery furnace in the first place. Because they knew that these men would be faithful. Now that we've entered the court scene, we can go on with the accusation. Now we can continue and see uh, the investigation from Nebuchadnezzar in verse 13. It says, then, then Nebuchadnezzar in his rage and fury commanded to bring Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Then they brought these men before the king. Nebuchadnezzar spake and said unto them, Is it true, O Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, do not ye serve my gods, nor worship the golden image which I have set up? Now, if you be ready, that at what time you hear the sound of the cornet, the flute, the harp, the sagba, the psaltery, and dulcimer, and all kinds of music, you fall down and worship the image which I have made, well, but if you worship not, you shall be cast the same hour in the midst of the burning fiery furnace, and who is that God? that shall deliver you out of my hands. You know, there's, there's a, a part of the king where he's actually being merciful. He's willing to restart the whole ceremony just for these three guys. To, to restart the band, to restart the music, to restart the services, everything. Just so that these guys could do the right things, of course, in his eyes. Clearly, over the years, they've gained some respect. But the king also does not allow any defiance. It has to be his will and nothing else. Maybe he's thinking, maybe, maybe they didn't hear properly. Maybe they, they, they don't realize the importance of these things. Um, maybe they just didn't get it yet. After all, everybody else has bowed down. It's only these three guys. Maybe there were even Jews there that also bowed down, but not these three guys. So, they didn't hear it right. And now that the king explained it clearly, uh, certainly they, they will go along with it. Because remember, in our very first lesson, we talked, our, our second lesson our, in the chapter one, we talked how the king did not want them to convert immediately. That was in Prophets and Kings, page 481. But he hoped to bring this about gradually, a change from the worship of God to idolatry, slowly. By, by making them daily be in contact with uh, idolatry and pagan custom. Now, most people today would, would think that's, that's not a big deal. Now, how many times have you heard the joke, you know, they could have just tied their shoes. 
Of course, they were wearing sandals, so it makes no sense either. But it's such a small thing. It'll be over soon. It's not a big deal. Just stay out of trouble. You know, go with the flow, as people would always say. But what about the impact? What if they would have actually bowed down? How would it have impacted their witness to those around them? What does it say about their religion, their faith? Well, if it's no big deal to bow down before an idol, it means that their religion, their faith is no big deal. It means nothing, really. It's just nothing. In Selected Messages, page 312, we have an important statement here. It says, to bow down when in prayer to God is the proper attitude to occupy. This act of worship was required of the three Hebrew captives in Babylon, but such an act was homage to be rendered to God alone, the sovereign of the world, the ruler of the universe. And these three Hebrews refused to give such honor to any idol, even though composed of pure gold. In doing so, they would, to all intent and purposes, be bowing to the king of Babylon, refusing to do as the king had commanded. They suffered the penalty and were cast into the burning, fiery furnace. They understood that you could not do that. They understood that if we bow down now, we are bowing down to another god, and they refused to do that. Now, some also ask, well, why were they even there in the first place? Well, remember? The king invited people to a dedication. That's all. They went as far as they could without having their conscience seared, their conscience destroyed. You wouldn't find these guys in a club, in, in, in any club, whether it's a karaoke club, it's a club with music. They wouldn't be there. They wouldn't be in bars. They wouldn't be in strip clubs. They wouldn't be in any of these places. But here, they stay true to principle. They refuse to worship something that was not God. There was no compromise in their faithfulness. Verse 16. This is the response. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we are not careful to answer thee in this matter. If it be so, our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace, and he will deliver us out of thine hand, O king. But if not, be it known unto thee, O king, that we will not serve thy gods, nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. You know what's really important here? Is that God is able to deliver. That he is able to save. That he can. But what if he chooses not to? How would you react? Would you stop trusting in him? Do you abandon your faith? Do you ask God, why? Why am I in this situation? Why is this happening to me? I did this and I did that and I followed your will. Why? Why aren't you delivering me? And let's be honest, things don't always turn out the way we wish they would. Now, I like the way uh, C. Marvin Maxwell uh, writes it here. It says, to their everlasting honor, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego also knew that although God is always with us, he does not always choose to deliver us in the way we would like him to. Only a few years prior to the event at the fiery furnace, God had not worked a miracle to protect the prophet Uriah, who preached against the crime of King Jehoiakim. God allowed Jehoiakim to execute him. Sometimes the Christian employee who never steals anything is miraculously kept on the job when the rest of his unit is laid off. But not always. Sometimes the Christian girl who insists on remaining a virgin is later voted high school queen. But not often. More often than not, the Christian boy who doesn't laugh at a dirty joke gets laughed at. In Gethsemane, Jesus prayed, Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou wilt. The answer was death on Calvary. God can deliver us, 
but often he chooses to have us witness for him in apparent defeat rather than in obvious victory. It's, um, it's a hard thing for us as, as fallen men to, to have to put our lives fully into God's hand. We, we like to be in control. We, we like to know how things are going to come, and we don't like to submit fully. It's hard. We want to decide for ourselves. But does God know better? Yeah, of, <laughs> of course he knows better. But what happens when God's knowledge doesn't go according to what we want? It's, it's hard to see trials and persecution, uh, financial tr struggles, diseases, and even sometimes death as God knowing better. I came to realize sometime that maybe God is, is keeping me alive um, because he's not done with me. Maybe he has not secured me yet and he still has to work with me while somebody else has been put to sleep because God has secured him. I don't know, I don't have the answer, but God does. Here's what I came to learn, is whatever God chooses, when I get to see why he chose that, I'll agree with him. And no matter how painful and hard and difficult it was, if I had to do it again, I would do it exactly the same way God had chosen to. Because God would never do anything malicious to us. He does everything for the purpose of saving us. I want to re-emphasize verse 18. It says, but if not, be it known unto thee, O king, that we will not serve thy gods nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. These men did not follow God because he would save them. He followed God, they followed God because he could and because he can. If he chooses not to, their faith were not going to be impacted. What made them faithful is God can. Not God will, but God can. God has the power. God is able. Whatever he chooses to do, that's his decision. That's his will. In the Youth's Instructor, page 51, we read here that when the king was troubled in regard to his dream, these men, that's Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, with Daniel, had fasted and prayed that they might understand the dream. The Lord had heard their cries, and he had given to Daniel wisdom to interpret the dream to the king. Thus their own lives and the lives of the astrologers and soothsayers had been saved. Now the very man who had escaped death through the mercies of God to his servant had been the prime movers in securing the decree in regard to the worship of the golden image. But the three Hebrew made no mention of these things. They knew that a controversy with the king would only increase his fury. They knew what had happened. They knew all these things but they did not even bother. The truth is, defending themselves would have done nothing. They did not retaliate. They did not accuse back. They simply placed their faith in the hand of the God who is able to save. I like this passage here again from the youth's instructor. It says, true Christian principle does not stop to weigh consequences. It does not ask, what will people think of me if I do this? Or how will it affect my worldly prospect if I do that? With singleness of purpose, the children of God desire to know what he would have them do. That their work may glorify him. The Lord has made ample provision that the hearts and lives of his followers shall be controlled by divine grace. That they may, they may be as burning and shining lights in the world. Leave the consequences with God. We've looked at the accusation, the investigation, the response. 
And now let's find out about the sentence and the execution. Verse 19. Then was Nebuchadnezzar full of fury, and the form of his visage was changed against Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Therefore he spake and commanded that they should heat the furnace one seven times more than it was wont to be heated. Now, some people make a big fuss about this idea of seven times, saying that it's impossible, it couldn't be done, plus how would they even measure that, and so on and so forth, and they discredit the whole uh, passage just because of that. Well, first of all, there's no record that they were actually able to do that. What we know is that he was angry, the king was angry, and he wanted that. He could have said a hundred times hotter. He could have said a million times hotter. He just wanted it hot. Now in Christianity, of course, the number seven has significance. It means completeness or perfection. One thing is for sure is the king wanted their destruction to be complete and immediate. Now why is the king so angry? Like, he's, like it says, he's, he's, he is full of fury. Well, as we have seen here, signs of the time confirm that when the king saw that his will was not received as the will of God, he was full of fury and the form of his visage was changed against these men. It even says that his attribute became satanic. He was angry because he was not seen as God. Verse 20, and he commanded the most mighty men that were in his army to bind Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and to cast them into the burning fiery furnace. Then these men were bound in their coats, their hosen, and their hats, and their other garments, and were cast into the midst of the burning fiery furnace. Therefore, because the king's commandment was urgent and the furnace exceeding hot, the flame of the fire slew those men that took Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And these three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, fell down bound into the midst of the burning, fiery furnace. You know, the story could have ended there. It could have ended with these men dying in the furnace. And you know, their witness would have still been incredibly powerful. Powerful because they refuse, even at the cost of their lives to give up on God, and they died for their faith. Of course, the story did not end there. God was obviously not done with them. Verse 24, Then Nebuchadnezzar the king was astonished, and rose up in haste, and spake and said unto his counselors, Did not we cast three men bound into the midst of the fire? They answered unto the king, True, O king. He answered and said, Lo, I see four men loose, walking in the midst of the fire, and they have no hurt. And the form of the fourth is like the Son of God. Now this passage has spilled so much ink. People have argued so much, arguing the translation should not be the Son of God, but rather the, a Son of the Gods, or the Son of the Gods. People just don't want to accept that this could actually be the pre-incarnate Jesus. Why not? I mean, he appeared to Abraham. He fought with Jacob. Uh, he, he was there with Joshua. He's appeared before. He was there with his faithful. Why could he not be there? There's no reason why not. The other answer is, well, because Nebuchadnezzar would not know. He would not know who the Son of God looked like or was. But why not? What do you think Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego had been doing all these years in Babylon? From the review in Herald, May 3, 1892, we read, How did Nebuchadnezzar know that the form of the fort was like the Son of God? He had heard of the Son of God from the Hebrew captives that were in his kingdom. They had brought the knowledge of the living God who ruleth all things. Remember, the, the king's goal was to recondition the young Hebrews and make them Babylonians. But God had a different plan. God allowed these men to be in Babylon to bring a knowledge of the truth to them so that they could be witnesses, so that Nebuchadnezzar could know, could understand, could learn about the true God. That's how merciful God is. 
Remember the story of Joseph? If you read, we know that his brothers were jealous of him and, and sold him off. But interestingly enough, when you read in Psalm 105, verse 17, it says, speaking of God, that he sent a man before them, even Joseph, who was sold for a servant. God designed that Joseph would be there. And even Joseph understood that in, verse, in chapter 50 of Genesis, verse 20, he says, but as for you, speaking to his brother, you thought evil against me, but God meant it for good to bring to pass as it is this day to save much people alive. How wonderful the, the mysterious dealing of God. He knows the end from the beginning. Of course, Nebuchadnezzar knew who the Son of God was. He heard about him. Look how he speaks about God in verse 26. Then Nebuchadnezzar came near to the mouth of the burning fiery furnace and spake and said, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, you servant of the Most High God, come forth and come hither. Then Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came forth of the midst of the fire. He calls him the Most High God. It goes on saying, the princes, governors, and captains, and the king's counselor being gathered together saw these men upon whose bodies the fire had no power, nor was an hair of their head singed, neither were their coats changed, nor the smell of fire had passed on them. What a contrast between them and the guards who threw them in. The guards did not even get to the furnace and they were consumed. These men were in the furnace and did not even smell like fire of smoke. Have you ever been near to a fire? You know how hard it is to get the smell off of you? These guys had nothing. I like the way uh, Uriah Smith describes the scene. Every circumstance revealed the direct power of God. The Hebrews were bound in all their garments, but came out with not even the smell of fire upon them. The mightiest men in the army were chosen to cast them in, but the fire burned them before they came in, in, in contact with it. But upon the Hebrews, it had no effect, although they were in the very midst of the flame. It is evident that the fire was under the control of some supernatural intelligence. For while it consumed the cords with which they were bound, so that they were free to walk about in the midst of a fire, it did not even singe their garments. They did not spring out of the fire as soon as free, but remained in it. For the king had put them into the furnace, and it was his place to call them out. Then, too, the form of the fort was with them, and in his presence they could be content and joyful, as well as in the furnace of fire, as in, a, as in the delights and luxuries of, of the palace. Let us, in all our trials, afflictions, persecution, and straitened places, but have the form of the fort with us, and it is enough. Don't worry about the burning furnace, the persecution, the trail, the difficulty. Just make sure you have the form of the fort with you. Hear God, the highest court of the universe, overturn the sentence of Nebuchadnezzar. Even Nebuchadnezzar can't argue with that. And the image that was set up, my, nobody's talking about it anymore. It's a thing of the past. Now everybody's focused on these men that has miraculously survived the burning furnace. Not even the king is thinking about that. Verse 28. Then Nebuchadnezzar spake and said, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who has sent his angel and delivered his servants that trusted in him and have changed the king's word and yielded their bodies that they might not serve nor worship any god except their own god. Therefore I make a decree that every people, nation, and language which speak anything amiss against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego shall be cut in pieces and their houses shall be made a dunghill, because there is no other God that can de deliver after this sort. Then the king promoted Shadrach, 
Meshach and Abednego in the province of Babylon. Now, Nebuchadnezzar was absolutely right to praise God, but he went too far. You can't legislate the worship of the God of heaven. But Nebuchadnezzar was not free from human pride. He still had some arrogance. He still thought of himself very high. But at least now he knew God a, as one who knows the, the end from the beginning, the revealer of secret. He now knows God as the one who is able to save. But he's also going to have to learn to know God as his creator, as his sustainer, and as his judge. But that's for next week. Now, it is a fantastic story. The but if not is just so powerful. But if you've been paying attention, there's something very interesting, something that you cannot but think about. Daniel 3 and Revelation 13 cannot be separated. Let's come to the board here for a moment. Let's do some comparison. Daniel 3, Revelation 13. Here you have an image that is being built. Here you have an image, but this time the image is to the beast. You have here people of all nations, of all, peop uh, of all people and all language that are gathered together. Here you have the whole world that is gathered, all them that dwell. That's how the Bible puts it. Here, the king sentenced whoever does not worship the image to death. Here, the beast, interestingly enough, causes some penalty, including death. In Daniel 3, the king commands worship. Here, it is all, all that does not worship. So there is a, a causing, a forcing, an enforcement of worship. Here, whosoever refuses to worship, so refusal, Ends up in what? In death. Here, refusal eventually ends up in what? That's right, in death as well. You cannot escape the comparison. You cannot not see how Daniel 3 points to Revelation 13. You cannot escape how Revelation 13 looks back to Daniel 3. And you know what's very interesting is when you read Daniel 3 over and over again, there's repetition that is there all the time. And it's not there just because they didn't know how to write. Every time something is being repeated in the Bible is to bring your attention, is to uh, catch, your, catch your attention so, so, so that your mind may focus. You know how many times we hear that the image was set up? How many times we hear that it's commended? How many times we have all these things? So that we can understand what this is going to look like. And you know what's fascinating? And I didn't mention it until now. But every time in Daniel 3 that there is a commandment to worship, a commandment to worship, there's something that always precedes it. And it's all kind of music. The psaltery, the dulcimer, the sackbut. Every time, every time they would hear the music, they would fall down. They would hear the music, they would fall down in worship. They would hear the music, they would fall down. Why? Because music was there to give them not only the, this is the time, 
but it changes the way you think. All kind of music can bypass your frontal lobe that you're not thinking anymore and you're just acting almost as a reflex. What makes you think that this will not be used in the end time? Already you look in our churches and you have all kind of music, bedlam of noises. You can't even distinguish what is solemn music anymore because it's so rare and few in our churches. People are being almost programmed to worship. They will hear this music fall to their knees and worship whatsoever they can hear, whatsoever uh, they will see before them. Even the image to the beast. From Daniel chapter 1, these men had purpose in their heart not to be defiled. This week as we were um, worshiping at home, we were asking ourselves, you know, I, how can I be like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? How can I stand in these days and make sure that I don't get deceived and, and start to worship falsity? And we understood that it began in Daniel 1 that they had set their heart not to be defiled. And every decision was motivated by this idea that God is supreme and that I will not do anything that will not bring, bring glory to God. Luke 16, 10, Jesus says, Jesus said, he that is faithful in that which is least is faithful also in much in the least if we are faithful in the least in the small things when something big like that comes we'll have had so much practice that it'll be a lot easier for God to empower us for us to be faithful in the face of big things Revelation 12 11 says and they overcame him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimonies and they love not their lives unto death. You know, that's, that's Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They didn't love their lives unto death. And we, we have to come to that point in our lives. You know, you never hear about them ever again. This is the last thing we hear about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. But what a powerful testimony. What a powerful lesson for us and when I see this when I see this type of testimony that was left behind I ask myself the question today do I have this type of witness and it I need to ask myself what legacy am I leaving behind reminds me of the song from uh, Steve Green, find us faithful. It says at the end, may the fire of our devotion light their way. May the footprints that we leave lead them to believe. And the lives, to li the lives we live inspire them to obey. Oh, may all who come behind us find us faithful. I look at these three Hebrew men and I can say, yes, they were faithful. And now I ask myself, those who will come after me, will they be able to turn back and say, this man was faithful? And now I ask the question, those who come after you, will they also say, this man, this woman was faithful? This is the whole point of what Daniel is teaching us. We need to be faithful now that we may remain faithful later. As we've studied today, as we've discovered, only God is worthy of worship. And everything that we do, we must ask ourselves, will it bring glory to God? And if not, we need to refrain from it, no matter how much we want to. We must remain faithful until the end. This is my appeal and my prayer to today. Let's pray. 
Father, I want to thank you so much for, again, an amazing story in the scripture. A story that not only teaches us how to prepare for the end, but teaches us how you are also faithful. And that, Father, we can place our lives in your hands. And Father, I want to place my life in your hand right now so that whatsoever you choose to do with it, I accept it. Whether you deliver or you don't, Father, I know you're doing it because you have a greater purpose. And I thank you, Lord, for being faithful. Father, I ask also that you forgive any sins that I may have, forgive any sins that we all may have at this time. Help us to walk faithfully. Help us to have our hearts stayed upon you and give us the courage, Lord, to stand true before any potentate, king, or anyone out there that demands for us to compromise. Because, Father, you are able to save us. But if not, we're still going to follow you. Thank you, Father, I pray in the name of Jesus, our Lord, our Savior, our righteousness, the fourth man in the furnace. Amen.